Só umas pequenas palavras em português. Esta apresentação era para ser feita pelo José Vitor Malheiros. O José Vitor Malheiros, infelizmente, não pôde vir ao Porto e enviou para mim um texto que eu vou ler. Portanto, qualquer problema que o texto tenha, falem com ele depois. Um, ok. Um, first, I would like to thank the organizing committee of this SICOM Portugal 2014 for the kind invitation they addressed me to apologize for not being able to be present and to wish you all an excellent two day of conferences, round tables, and most importantly, coffee breaks. <laughs> It was an enormous pleasure to be invited to present Bruce Lewinstein, as I think he is and has been for the last 20 years one of the central figures in the science communication arena. It is enough to browse through his teaching posts covering subjects as communication in the life sciences, science writing for the mass media, public communication of science and technology, public engagement in science, to understand his broad interests in the field that cover also specifically with num numerous publications to prove it, subjects like citizen science, science museums, and science centers, and the informal science education movement, the history of science communication, the ethics of science communication, and so on, and so on. Bruce Lewinstein is not only a scholar, a teacher, and a theoretical researcher, but an experimentalist and a practitioner as a consultant, a writer, and an editor, and has made available through his research a large corpus of relevant data for all science communication professionals. Bruce Lewinstein is one of those scholars that has contributed largely to the migration from the top-down approach of the public understanding of science to the more civic public engagement with science and technology a change of paradigm that, in my opinion, has affected first and foremost the science communication researchers and much less the science communication practitioners themselves. But I think this change is really happening, that the times, they are changing, that this shift is in tune with a renewed demand for an active citizenship and there is no better person to talk to us about it than Bruce Lewinstein. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. It got turned off. We have a brief delay while the computer comes up. It's not working. It's not working. Okay. Maybe you can yeah, use it. I, I just, just use that. Yeah. Bom dia. I'm sorry, that's the only Portuguese I can, I can use. <laughs> um, thank you very much for those kind words of introduction, both from you and from your, from your colleague. Um, and I, I also want to thank the organizers of the, uh, of the meeting for inviting me. Uh, thank the U.S. Embassy and the American Corners Program at the University of Aveiro for, for funding the visit and making it possible and to 
Jose Azevedo for, for hosting me and arranging all of the details. Thank you very much. This problem with getting the computers set up, uh, you know of our famous uh, President Abraham Lincoln and one of his most famous addresses is called the Gettysburg Address. It was delivered uh, at a cemetery during the Civil, American Civil War about 150 years ago. And that, that address, it's very short. It's only a few minutes long. It's something that every child, every school child learns to say to, to be able to repeat that speech. Um, it's a beautiful piece of rhetoric. If you Google Gettysburg Address PowerPoint, what you will find is what the Gettysburg Address would look like if we used PowerPoint. And it's something like, good afternoon. Uh, uh, does anybody know how to work this computer? Uh, no, I can't get it going yet. Please, um, we might have to reboot. Um, well, anyway, and sort of goes on like that. So I feel a little bit like that as we get started. Anyway, what I want, th those comments about sort of what the role of, of the deficit model and thinking about top-down communication and whether we should be learning to think about a bottom-up engagement are, are very much what I want to talk about today. Although I think what I may end up doing is saying that we have to go back to the deficit model. So we'll see, what, so we'll see where we end up here. Um, because what I want to talk about today is not just the idea of models of communication, but the politics of science communication. We like to think of science communication as being, um, uh, uh, as, as being independent of politics, just as we like to think about science as being independent of politics. But it's not. There actually is a deep politics to how we think about what our goals are as science communicators and how we're going to accomplish what, uh, what we want to, to achieve. So um, as we go through this, think about that, the, those political issues. And so what do I mean by, by a politics of science communication? Well, first we have to recognize that science communication is meeting a variety of different needs and different people have different needs and different organizations have different needs at different times. So sometimes we're trying to meet that personal need for information, things that people need to know to make decisions in their personal lives about what medicines to take or what computers to buy or how to, whether or not to get buy a hybrid car or, or things like that. Sometimes we're trying to meet a national need because of the goals of economic development and the goals of um, public health or national security or public transportation systems. That is, we're trying to make democratic decisions and we need to be, know something about the science and technology in order to tell our representatives what policies we think should be introduced. Sometimes, and we sometimes forget about this, we're trying to serve a cultural need. That is, sometimes we communicate about science because it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's like art, it's like music, it's one of the supreme achievements of the human mind, and it's just good, to, it's part of what makes us human, is the fact that we can do science. That's another need that we sometimes, uh, it's one of our goals, we sometimes forget about it, but it is there. The problem is, is that these different goals, the personal needs, the national needs, the cultural needs, sometimes they're in conflict. And what a politician does, and I mean this in the best sense of politics, uh, a politician takes competing interests and figures out how to put them together in a way that serves the interests of the community. The problem, of course, is that not everybody agrees on what the interests are and what the best allocation of resources are and so on. And so for science communication, which is trying to meet these multiple needs, sometimes there's a, there's a politics involved in doing that, in trying to understand what are our goals, who, whose interests are we serving, and whose interests uh, are, are most important for us. As we, in order to think about this, we have to think about what science communication itself is. And this is often the way we think about science communication. We think that work happens out here in the field, in the lab, and then some people talk about it at meetings, and, and maybe they, um, uh, they go to some kind of, uh, they circulate a preprint or something like that, and finally it gets published in a scientific journal, and then it's science, right? Only when it's published in the journal is it really science, and then only then does it go out to, through 
public communication of science through the kind of work that you all do uh, to magazines, to government reports, to policy documents, and so on. The problem is, is if you start studying science communication in detail and trying to see how does information actually flow, it looks a little bit more like this. Don't worry about the details. <laughs> um, that is to say, we still have lab and field work and preprints and journals, but those are only a very small part of a very complicated web. And information flows in all directions in this web or sphere of science communication uh, in which sometimes scientists get information from publics through things like citizen science. Uh, sometimes scientists get ideas for, for their own research because of something that they see in a popular magazine or in a newspaper story. Uh, people make up, have discussions about science in churches, in community forums and things like that where they may have a scientist there who's telling them about the latest research. All of these things mix together. And it's because of that mixing that we have to think about all of the ways in which the flow of information shapes science communication. So what I want to do today is I'm going to present, depending on how you count, two models or four models of, of science communication. And then at the end, I'm going to question whether anything that I've told you is right. So pay attention, but be ready to throw it all out. So the reason I said two models or four models, so I'm, I'm going to present four models of science communication. The deficit model, which we've, the top-down model that we've heard about. The contextual model, which is a more sophisticated version of the deficit model. A, and then two dialogue models. And some people like to just say, well, there's just deficit and dialogue. I think you'll see there are some reasons why I want to divide it into four uh, and show some of, these, some of these details. The deficit model, the top-down model, is the one that we're used to. It's the one that we've all uh, grown up with. It's based in a tremendously important need, the fact that, there's, that many of us and many of our people in our various communities recommend that there's a lack of, uh, recognize that there's a, a lack of public knowledge about science and, f and believe that the answer to this problem, that there's a deficit of knowledge, is that all we have to do is in knowledge and that will fill up the deficit and then everything will be better, whatever everything is. This leads to various kinds of measures of scientific knowledge of the kind that are done by the U.S. National Science Foundation or by the Eurobarometer series. Um, and because in the rest of what I say, it will sound as though I'm being a little bit critical of the deficit model, I want to make clear that there have been a tremendous amount of absolutely wonderful things produced through the deficit model, right? So we can look at the deficit model and we can see books of various kinds that are trying to convey information or science television shows. This is um, Bill Nye, the science guy, Nye Labs. Has Bill Nye come to Portugal? Do you know who Bill Nye is? And some people, yes. Yeah, so he's this sort of very enthusiastic television commentator. We like him at my university at Cornell because he's a graduate of our university. Um, uh, but he's, um, uh, anyway, he's an exciting guy on television. But again, he's just trying to deliver information. He, he will tell you he has a curriculum and he's trying to cover a curriculum. And of course, there's science centers and science museums. Normally, I have a picture in this slide of, of uh, a science center from the United States, but I really thought I probably ought to use one from Aveiro, <laughs> um, where I spoke yesterday. So um, uh, Ciencia y Viva is, you know, has all of these wonderful science centers. There's also all kinds of science journalism and science websites, uh, science news, Yahoo News, um, where, wherever you go. There's a tremendous amount of wonderful information out there. And that's what the deficit model has given us, is all of this incredibly useful and important information. But the question is, what has it given us in terms of solving whatever it is we understand the problem to be? So this is data from the United States. It looks very similar to data that I could have from, from Eurobarometer from about 1985 to about 2012, asking questions about what do, pe what, 
the basic factual questions about what do people know about whether the earth, the center of the earth is hot, true or false, whether the earth goes around the sun, true or false, um, are electrons smaller than atoms, true or false, and so forth. And what you find is that for several things like the center of the earth is hot and the earth around the sun um, and the fact that the continents move around on the face of the earth, something on the order of 80% of the American public gets that right and has gotten that right since 1985 up through the most recent study that we have, which is done in 2012. If you ask a bunch of other questions about um, do humans come from earlier species or did the universe begin with a big explosion? Uh, do antibiotics kill viruses? That's the only thing that shows an increase, a major increase over this time. Um, and the electrons are smaller than atoms, one is down there. You're down in the 50% range. Many people look at these data and are horrified. Right? This is awful. Particularly in those where in the United States where we have the problem of, of evolution, people who don't believe in evolution for religious reasons and so on. What I find interesting about this data is that it's, for the most part, absolutely flat. We've had 50 years of wonderful deficit model information delivery and nothing has changed. It's, the data is essentially flat across that time. Somehow, we're, this is not getting at whatever the problem is. There, there is one other interpretation. It's possible that the lines would have gone down if we hadn't had all that information. But I think most people would say it's just flat. So somehow, just delivering information isn't solving the problem. One of the reasons that there has been a political response to thinking about the deficit model is that the way the, the, the measurement of, uh, of data has gone is people have looked at it and said, well, there's a relatively small number of people at the top who are attentive to science, who pay attention to the newspapers and the television, and then um, get the right answers on those quizzes. There's another set of people, the interested people, who uh, uh, pay attention to the news, but they get the wrong answers on, the, on some of those questions. And then there's 80%, usually, of the public that doesn't pay attention and doesn't get the right answers. And this is based on a political science theory. And according to this theory, this group is called the residual group, the leftovers. There's something wrong with, a, with an analysis in which 80% of the people are leftovers, are just set aside, they're residuals. That's the political problem. How can we think about a way of talking about science where we are not just talking to the 10 or 20% at the top, but we're talking to everybody, where we're including everybody in discussions about science and in what we're trying to achieve. There are some technical details about why asking people questions about Earth going around the sun uh, and asking people to answer these out of context questions that actually have very little to do with their daily lives. This very limited um, interpretive way of thinking about it, of having a residual. The fact that it's easy to misinterpret, that calling people scientifically literate is, a, is an act of power to say you're illiterate is an act of power, and that is not always a useful way of engaging people in discussion. And then finally, as I said, the, the fact that we have this data going back about 35 years um, to the late 1970s, and there's just been no progress. And so that makes me think that, um, in fact, there's substantial evidence to show that there is no link between how you answer the questions and whether you support science or not, um, whether you're active in science. It's just measuring a deficit doesn't really help us. So instead, we've tried to develop things that are more contextual models. Still information delivery, but now thinking more about context. And these are ones which recognize that people are different, and that people have different kinds of social psychological reasons for responding to information. They may respond because of emotions. They may respond because they have a preference for an authoritarian perspective, someone to tell them the answer 
as opposed to someone who wants to question authority. They may have deep religious faith that shapes how they respond to information and so forth. So what the contextual model does is it, it recognizes these social contexts, it recognizes demographic issues, um, it recognizes that people have institutional trust. And to just give a sort of simple example of why context matters, right? Think about two different visits to a science center. That's me, a little hard to tell in this light, and that's my middle son, who is now 24, so this picture is getting a little bit old, <laughs> um, uh, and is currently in Jakarta um, on a business trip. Um, if I, I took him to the Science Center, and we played with something about how to, how to get something to float just below the surface of the water, but not to sink, and um, so forth. Does he remember anything about buoyancy? Probably not. What he remembers is, I had a good time with Dad at the Science Center. Right? We went out and had, we did something fun. These are my students. I took them to the Science Center. What do they want to know? What do they remember? Is it going to be on the test? Right? They have a very different experience of the Science Center, depending on whether they went as part of a family group or whether they go as part of a school group. That's the most simple way we can think about the contextual model, but there are many other ways. In the United States, as you know, we have many people who are um, let, who, who, who do not believe that climate change is caused by humans or that uh, there's anything we can do about it. And sometimes this is presented as a, you're either for climate change or against. But in fact, when we've done studies, what we've done is we've seen that they're devoted into, they're divided into what we call six Americas. This is work done by um, Tony Lazarowitz at Yale University plus a team, big team of others, where we have some people who are alarmed by what's happening. We have about a quarter of the people who are concerned about what's going to happen, um, about another quarter who are cautious. They, they think it's real, but you know, they're not super concerned. There's 10% who are just disengaged. They're just not paying attention. That's, that, there is a real residual there, but now it's only 10%. There are 15% who are doubtful, are not rabidly anti against uh, climate change, but they're, they're doubtful. And there's only 10% who are dismissive, who actually say there's nothing there, this is all a fraud, this is a hoax. Those numbers turn out to be somewhat similar to what you can find in some other countries. This data is from India, I won't go through the exact details, but you can see that the circles are in the same order of, of size, so that, um, there's a more complex relationship with knowledge about climate change. It's not just pro or con, it's, it's got various gradations. You can do a similar thing with interest in new technologies. This is work that was done by the Wellcome Trust in the UK about um, 10 or 15 years ago. Are you confident about new technologies versus are you concerned? Are you interested in new technologies versus uninterested? And how much do you trust the regulation of new technologies? And what you can see is that you have people broke down into, again, about six groups. This was done with factor analysis. Um, you have a set of people who are confident believers. They believe in new technologies. They're confident in them. They trust in the regulatory system. They're not all that interested. They're only about halfway up on that interest category. You go to the people up here, the technophiles, those are the people who are really interested in new technologies, but they're halfway between concerned and confident. They think there's problems. And notice that they have one of the lowest levels of trust in, uh, in the regulatory system. And you can see, and there it goes around, so you've got this set of people who are at the same level of concerned and confident. They have more trust, actually, in the regulatory system but they're just uninterested in technology. So here's an, another example of how we have to pay attention to where people are in the system, what cut their beliefs are, what their interests are, in order for us to understand how we can communicate with them. We have to think about other kinds of contexts. Language issues, the fact that I can speak to you in English and most of you are able to understand me, um, that works in this country. It actually doesn't even work in the United States. 
um, where we have a large majority, a large minority of people who don't speak English. Um, so we have to present things in, um, in Spanish. If you go to the Center for Disease Control for the Public Health Agency at the United States, they've got something, there are what, eight or 10 of the most spoken languages in the United States and everything is presented in all of those languages. So we have Spanish and Italian and Russian and uh, Tagalog from the Philippines, um, Chinese, Korean, all of those things. We have to prepare materials in all of those languages. That's a very simple context issue. There are historical reasons. We, the African American community in the United States, as you know, has been, um, uh, there's been racial prejudice against them for many years, some of which has shown up in science experiments uh, where they have been discriminated against. So there's a great deal of distrust in the African American community to the medical system, the organized medical system. And you have to be careful about how you present that kind of information. What the contextual model does is it says, let's pay attention to all these differences and let's not try to talk to everybody in the same way. So to the concerned people um, in climate change, we can ask, what, what can the US do to reduce global warming? They want to know, they are assuming we can move forward in that. The people who are cautious, who are in the middle, what harm will global warming cause? It's their, they're cautious, they think it might be true, but they want to know more about what it will come. These are the skeptical people. Their question is, how do you know that global warming is occurring? I have a different question. So depending on where people are, you need to address these different questions. So the implications of the contextual model, and the words on this slide are taken from one of my students, Matt Nisbet, who's now at American University. Oh, I think he's about to move. Um, uh, the implications of the contextual model are that you need to segment your audience, you need to think very about, you don't sort of treat it as a single audience, but you really have to pay attention. That you need to frame your message. You need to decide what, what approach to take, what information to provide. And scientists are often very concerned when we talk about framing because they think that means spinning. And it's not. Anything you say is framed because you can never say everything. So a frame is just saying, given a limited set of information, which frame do you use? It actually turns out there may be some danger for increasing polarization because as we move into a new media world where people tend to, to get a lot of their information through comment sections and choosing which publications to read um, or to view online, there's an echo chamber where they, they talk only to people like themselves. Um, and so there's a problem that way. Um, and finally, the problem with the con contextual model, like the deficit model, is that it still is treating audiences just as receivers. That is, they are spectators, or they're consumers, or they're voters. They're not active participants in a political discussion. And that's the problem that we're trying to, um, trying to address by thinking, saying, well, okay, what are these problems? Um, we're still thinking one way. We're still thinking that there's a problem here that involves knowledge. It's just a matter of we have to be better at delivering it. So instead, we now move to those dialogue models, to the ones that, are, that say, let's, let's bring in the information from, that is out there in communities. And the first of these dialogue models is called lay knowledge. Um, the idea that issues about ethics or issues about local knowledge may be as important or more important than the scientific knowledge. And this model was developed uh, in the 1990s as part of an academic, partly an academic response to some of the problems with the deficit model, but also as a political response. It was, ex it was developed by people who very much believed that um, large institutions have too much power and that it's really important to find ways to break that power. It's, it says that people already know something. They already have knowledge out there and we have to figure out how to bring that knowledge into the discussion. It tends to be very supportive. It tends to, to, va to value the knowledge that people in communities have, perhaps even more than scientific knowledge. 
but it is very much based on what people do in the real world. And the iconic study of this kind was done by a sociologist in the UK named Brian Wynn. In the weeks just after the Chernobyl nuclear explosion, there was fallout that came across Europe, um, and some of it fell in the hills of Cumbria in the northwest of England. And the, the Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Fisheries in the UK told the farmers in that area that they could not bring their sheep to market, could not bring their lambs to market because they were eating grass that had been contaminated by radioactive fallout, and so it was not safe to eat that um, to, to, for that meat to go to market. And they said, but it's okay, in three weeks everything will be okay. Um, because we've done, we've done the models, we know what the half-life is, what the take-up is, it'll be fine. Six weeks later, when they were still saying that you can't bring your lambs to market, um, and they were saying, uh, you have to, we will tell you, let's say market day was Wednesday, I forget exactly, we will tell you on Monday whether or not you can bring your sheep to market. And the farmers said, but it takes us three days to bring our sheep in to, 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 to the farm to take them to market. You can't tell us two days in advance whether or not we can take them to market because we've already done all the work at that point. Also, you're telling us that our sheep are contaminated, but this is all based on runoff. And doesn't the runoff hit the, the hillsides and pool in these pools at the bottom? And so if we keep our sheep on the upper levels, aren't we avoiding some of the, the runoff problems? And it turned out the scientists hadn't thought about that. It also turned out that their estimates of the cesium uptake was based on soil samples from other parts of England that were not the same as what it was in Cumbria. It turned out that the local community knew things and had relevant information that the scientists were not willing to accept and that therefore led to the scientists making the wrong decisions wrong both scientifically and socially and politically. It was that episode that led Wynne and others to develop this idea of the lay knowledge model. It's based very much in a lack of trust in institutions. You can see this in cancer clusters. Um, I actually forgot to see whether this is a problem in Europe and Portugal as well, where communities have identified a cancer cluster where statistically the, the biostatisticians will say, well, it's not, you know, there's always variation. We don't have a big enough sample here to make a, to make a real conclusion. But the families in a, in a neighborhood all know there's more kids getting cancer in this community than there ought to be. And there's a chemical plant just up the hill that's been spilling stuff for years. And isn't there a connection there? And again, it takes local communities which have had to take action sometimes against the, the wishes or the power of local institutions, local companies, even local health agencies, to push the authorities to recognize that there is, in fact, a real problem. Another version of lay knowledge is the, the indigenous knowledge uh, idea, the idea that scientists have often not recognized knowledge that local communities um, of Native communities have developed over hundreds or thousands of years. There are other cases that sometimes people point to lay knowledge and say, well, it's relevant here. And these are things like evolution or climate change, vaccines and autism, uh, the question of whether those are caused, questions of GMOs or hydrofracking, um, uh, so on. I'm going to come back to them because this is the place where I'm not sure that local knowledge gets us to the right place because in at least some of these cases there are people actively denying what is pretty well established by real science. Um, and it's I think one of the, one of the places that we, we need to think about. Nonetheless, local knowledge is important because it does offer this more democratic approach to thinking about knowledge. It's not just addressing mistrust, it's not just ad addressing misunderstanding, but it's, it's about an active construction of knowledge that, um, that where we recognize the value of what the community has and where we recognize that social and economic and legal and regulatory and all kinds of other information need to be on the table in order to have a discussion of a complex social issue. 
Lay knowledge is not just about scientific controversies. It also involves ways in which ordinary citizens contribute to the development of scientific knowledge through things like citizen science, where people are out gathering information about birds or fish or um, plants in a particular area. Uh, I was involved in a project called Project Pigeon Watch, which is particularly useful in cities. Turns out there's a real genetic question about why all of the colors that pigeon fanciers have developed over hundreds of years, when you release those pigeons back out into the wild, they should return to wild type. They should go back to the sort of blue-gray ordinary pigeon. But in fact, those colors maintain themselves. And it's not clear why, so you need lots of people, often school kids, out gathering data to try to figure out what's happening. Citizen science has exploded in the last five to 10 years, so there's birds, there's astronomy projects, there are multiple websites like citizenscience.org or scienceforcitizens.net where you can go and get directories of programs. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of citizen science programs out there. A lot of them do have a bit of a, uh, of a lay knowledge perspective in the sense that they are critical of institutions, particularly water quality um, monitoring programs that uh, often are a community concerned about the pollution in their local community. They can't get anybody to acknowledge it, so they set up their own monitoring system. They find ways to collect the data. They find ways to, to analyze it. There are also some new forms of lay knowledge that I think we as a science communication community are just beginning to, um, to deal with, thinking about do-it-yourself biology, people creating their own recombinant DNA in their garages um, or um, in science fairs and things like that. The whole um, maker culture, um, uh, sort of technology hacking kind of culture, these are also places that celebrate the fact that it, you don't have to be a professional scientist to be involved in creating new knowledge. And I, th I think we haven't, I think those are part of lay knowledge. We, we haven't really thought about it. Nonetheless, the lay knowledge model does have problems as well. Um, because it privileges the local knowledge, I'm not sure that it does a very good job of paying attention to what we do know through good science, through what I sometimes call reliable knowledge about the natural world. It's a way of avoiding the problems of what do we mean by science. Um, lay knowledge is very much driven by this political commitment to a bottom-up idea, um, to an idea of political empowerment that sometimes is very threatening to scientists who are, whose expertise is being questioned. Um, to say the whole citizen science, DIY bio, hacker, Thing I think we haven't settled out. And finally, the lay knowledge model tells me a lot about what's happening. It doesn't tell me what to do. If I'm a science communicator thinking about lay knowledge, okay, so it's out there. What do I do? What does that mean for what I have to do? And that's part of what leads us to, to the model that was developed mostly through the 2000s um, and into this century, uh, or into this decade rather, um, of what's called public engagement in science. And um, many people, when they talk about public engagement, are talking about these activities where we get citizens involved in various kinds of political decision making. And we do it through consensus conferences or citizens' juries, through deliberation of various kinds. There's also more informal ways of engaging people in discussion through science shops or science cafes. The idea, however, is always that there's a bottom-up way of having a discussion and that in this notion of public engagement that we are ultimately trying to feed political decision-making. So again, it's driven by an interest in politics. It's very much been an idea that's been taken up not just by science communicators, but by leaders of the science community. So this is Alan Leshner, who's the director of the, the CEO of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is the largest general interest science society in the world. They're the publishers of Science Magazine. He's been writing about public engagement for more than a decade now as a leader. They have a whole center for public engagement at AAAS. There have been other editorials in, in Nature, there have been reports from the European community, there are guidelines to public engagement. It's a very active kind of, kind of area. 
It's often about public participation in controversial issues. How are we going to talk about nanotechnology or genetically modified foods or synthetic biology? What are, the, what are the concerns that communities will have and how do we bring those into a discussion where it's not just about do you understand the technology of, um, of genetically modified foods, but you're also making political decisions about whether it's something you're, you want to have in your community. As we all know, that Europe has made different decisions than the US. That has implications for international trade, for countries in the developing world, because they have to decide where their markets are, and so forth. Public engagement in nanotechnology has been one of the areas where this has been developed the most, partly because nanotechnology as a field with lots of funding was developing at about the same time as the discussions about public engagement, and so it's where a lot of experimentation has been done, um, where there are citizens' conferences and science shops and so forth. There's a tricky thing to talking about public engagement, because I've been talking about it when it involves politics. It turns out that there's at least four different meanings of public engagement, which I think we have not recognized very well in the community. The first one is educational engagement. So if you talk, those of you who are from science centers, I'm sure talk all the time about engaging with your visitors and getting them engaged in the material. And it turns out there's a whole theory of educational engagement, which has to do about getting people excited and getting them integrated in the material. And it's really important, but it's not about the politics of engagement. Many of the people in the science communication, in the, that's one part of the science communication world. Many of the people in, a more, in the more sort of academic research oriented aspects of science communication are thinking about it in this political way um, and that political engagement. The people who are involved in citizen science, who sometimes go by the label of public participation in scientific research, also talk about engagement. For them, it's sort of in between. On the one hand, they want people engaged in doing the science. On the other hand, they often have some kind of political goals, as I said, through the environmental monitoring ones. So they're trying to do both. And finally, there's what I call institutional engagement. It turns out if you work for a science center, um, at least in the United States, not only do you want people engaged in the material, but you want people engaged in your science center. They want, you want them to come back to your institution, to your museum, to your program. You want people engaged with your organization. Um, and so that's an important part of what we mean by, by engagement as well. And people often um, say they don't recognize it, but if I go around scientific organizations and, and science centers and ask, what do you might mean by engagement? They often say, well, I mean that people like us a lot and they come back to see us. Not that they like science, that they like us. Right? Um, not surprisingly, I think there are some problems with the public engagement model as well. Um, first off, what kind of engagement are we talking about? The fact that it, it focuses on the process of getting people to talk to each other even if we're talking largely about the political one, but it doesn't focus on the content. It doesn't focus on how do we deliver information about science. Right? How do we get people to have a discussion that's informed by um, reliable knowledge? How do we get them to have that basic substantive knowledge? And finally, there's a problem of scaling this up to large groups. All of these little consultative groups are wonderful. Many of them are based on activities that started in, in um, in Denmark in the 1980s. And if you think Portugal is a small country, go to Denmark, right? It's even smaller. Um, it's, uh, it's a very small, homogenous country. It's very different than trying to have um, things happen in the United States with 320 million people in it. We can't scale up these, these discussions. And so it's, it's got problems that way. And in fact, partly as a result of these problems, in the last, just the last six months to a year, there have been a series of publications in the uh, scholarly community, a special issue of the journal Public Understanding of Science that came out in um, January of this year, it's the one I'm thinking of most particularly, about public engagement where a lot of people who've been studying these things are saying, you know, we've been talking about public engagement for 15 years, but it doesn't seem to be solving the problem either. It doesn't seem to be working. 
So we're beginning to recognize that, that, there, that there's a problem. So the question is why? Um, and partly I think it's because of this political issue that, it, that public engagement is not just about privileging local knowledge, it's not just about engaging people in discussions, but at its core, public engagement is about a very deep shift in political power from elites, and although scientists don't always like to believe this, they are part of the elite, they have much more authority in society than many other people do, um, and trying to shift power from elites to publics is problematic, as we all know. Do scientists have power? Are they willing to share power? I think they do. The other problem that we see is that across all of these, so that's a problem specifically with public engagement. Turns out that there's a problem with even talking about this as models. So this is work that was done, that I did in collaboration with uh, one of my former students, Dominique Broussard, who's now at the University of Wisconsin, where she and I looked at a bunch of projects, they all had to do with genomics, they were all funded through the US Genomics Pro Human Gen Genome Program, and we wanted to see, no matter how they described themselves, what did they actually do? And we divided them into, did they were they deficit model or dialogue, were they lay knowledge, were they um, public engagement, were they contextual? And according to the models, these are all separate. What we actually found when we tried to look at individual projects that are actually out there, no matter what they said they were doing, they were doing everything, right? It was all mixed in together. They were having a public engagement activity, but they were delivering information, or they were largely about delivering information, but then they would have subsidiary activities that were discussions about those things. They were going out and asking people about their knowledge of genetics, and they were incorporating that into the materials that they would then provide back. So while thinking about those four models may be useful analytically, it's not entirely clear that it describes what you do on a daily basis, except in, in a reflective way. I've given a version of this talk a number of times, and that's usually the place where I stop. Um, there are two reasons why I shouldn't stop today. So the first one is that there are, in fact, other ways of describing the models. Brian Trench, who's another active researcher in this field, used to teach at um, Dublin City University in Ireland. He, this is a photo I took a, about a month ago at a meeting in Brazil uh, where he was talking about models, and he's got dissemination, which would be the deficit model, engagement in the middle, um, hard to see there, and then he's got conversation as being a third model, so that engagement is somehow different than, than conversation. But more important, and the reason that I have as the third word of my, or the last word of my title, deniers, is that we have a whole set of what are sometimes known as wicked problems. They're wicked because they're practically impossible to solve. Right? These are problems that are difficult to define, they, there's multiple, these are, we're talking about big social problems now, big economic and um, uh, uh, national level kinds of problems. There's no obvious solution. They're socially complex, institutionally complex. Um, there have been many attempts to, to build policies in this area, these areas and they've often failed. So in science we think about nanotechnology or stem cells where there are problems. There are at least three kinds of wicked problems that involve science and politics. There's a set of them where the science is uncertain. We don't really know the answers yet. Things like synthetic biology or geoengineering or hydrofracking. We don't know well what the safety issues are, what the potential social implications are. Um, we're still doing research on it. Some people in the field think they know, but it's pretty easy to demonstrate that there are technical uncertainties in many of these fields, partly involving how you define what the relevant system is and so forth. There's a second set where the science may be reasonably well established, but social issues are highly relevant to making social decisions about them. These are things like the use of embryonic stem cells for research, using animals in research, genetically modified organisms in GM foods, 
Some people might move that up into the uncertainty. Some people would maybe move the um, hydrofracking down into the we know where we actually do know the things. These are not sharp boundaries, but it's an attempt to, to again see some of these differences. But then finally we have a set where it's clear that the science is pretty well established and yet there's a big community of deniers. And the three that I'm thinking of are, at least in the United States, evolution, where 50% of Americans do not believe in, in evolution. That's partly tied to religious beliefs, but not entirely. No serious scientist that I know questions that evolution exists and that we know a lot about it. Climate science, where again we have a perception in the United States of this divide between skeptics and, um, uh, and supporters, but in fact it's not quite that sharp of a divide. Um, but still there's clear um, um, lack of belief in the reality of this. Um, and finally, autism. Vaccines, most of the, op most of the claim that, that autism is caused by vaccines is based on a single article that has long since been shown to have been fraudulent and riddled with errors and um, with conflicts of interest. I mean, it's just flat out wrong and that there are multiple studies that have been done since then to show that there's no relationship between vaccines and autism. And yet, in a number of countries around the world, vaccination rates have fallen. Um, whether or not they've fallen so far as to threaten herd immunity is itself a little bit uncertain at this point. Um, but it's a, it's a serious problem. And the question is, how do we deal with it? So how can we, how can we deal with these wicked problems? Um, or indeed, with any of, any of the problems that we try to address? So one of the things we have to recognize is that scientists don't know very much about the public. It's not just whether the public knows about science. And that a lot of what we do as science communicators is help our scientist colleagues learn what the public is interested in and learn what their concerns are and learn what kinds of questions they, they have. We, there's also, I think, a general deficit, and I will call it that, of both public and scientists' knowledge about the real scientific process. Um, by real, I mean that science isn't this hypothetical, you come up with a hypothesis and you design an experiment and you test it and either it's um, confirmed or, uh, or denied. But that in fact, science is a complicated social process with large institutions that supports rooms like this. Um, that um, are very different than small protest rooms, you know, small meeting rooms and so forth. Um, there are ways of conveying this information. There's a new, uh, couple, for the last couple of years, the US National Academy of Sciences has been sponsoring some meetings called the Science of Science Communication, which is about really well, as collecting really well-established knowledge about what we know about publics. Um, those have been published in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and there's a bunch of videos online. There are the field of science and technology studies, which incorporates history of science and sociology of science, has handbooks that you can read. There will be a new one out about a year. In our own field of science communication, there's a handbook of public communication of science and technology. A new edition will be out any day now. Literally, I was told it would be out in June, so it might physically be here, I don't know. Um, that's the bottom one here. Um, that has a lot of information that we can use to help scientists and public understand more about science. What are the specific activities we can do? Well, we can have more classes, teach more people these things. We can try to sponsor discussions. We can give presentations like this one. You as communicators can, be, can think about your own goals, what it is you're trying to accomplish can be reflective about the politics, about your own politics, about what the implications are. Um, you can be strategic about what messages you can do. I could keep going on, but that still doesn't seem to me like it's addressing the problem. That's what the blah, blah, blah part is, right? I can just keep blah, 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 blah um, going on. Because it still doesn't get us to the problem of the deniers. It doesn't get us to the problem of who gets to decide what counts as good science, well-established science, and who gets to decide who is a denier. 
the fundamental point of the dialogue models, of the public engagement models, is to question the authority of science to be the ones that make this, science to be the, that scientists are the ones who make these decisions. And yet, it is clear that there are times when we do know the science and we somehow still have to convey um, and we have to deal with the deniers. So the question that we're left with and the place that I'm ending that's leading me to sort of question um, those four models that I started with is I'm trying to figure out how we can avoid falling into the trap of the deficit model, which is that we think we know the answer and we just have to deliver it, um, whether we're scientists or communicators, without losing track of the fact that we may, that no matter who we are, we may not be the right ones to make the decisions, that the whole point of democracies are to have large communities work through problems because for all of the problems that democracy has, it's better than anything else we've come up with. Um, and you in this country know this even more than we do in the United States because within, within, your, uh, within the lifetime of everyone in this room, you've had to deal with this problem. Or most people in this room, not everybody, I guess. But um, uh, for many people, you've had, you've had to deal with these kinds of transitions. And so the importance of democracy is something we, we need to take very seriously. And the conflict between deficit models and democracy is a, is a really challenging problem. So, um, so I think science communication itself is a wicked problem, right? It's a problem where um, for many of our goals, the answer is more democratic discussions, more dialogue, but democracy is imperfect um, and it can be hijacked by deniers and that's the problem we're certainly facing politically in the United States with evolution and with climate change. I don't know precisely what the problems are here, but I'm sure they're there. Sometimes the deficit model might be the right answer, but that's very uncomfortable if we want to take a political position that involves questioning authority. And as I've said, there is some data to show that the deficit model doesn't work. So that leaves us with a problem. Um, so I think um, in summary, we need to acknowledge the political dimensions of talking about these issues. Um, thinking about um, the, the politics are both personal politics and social politics. We need to recognize that in all of our activities we're using a bunch of different models and we need to be reflective about what those models are and what some of the assumptions that are built into them are. But we need to, moving forward, think about how to deal with the, the deniers. I have very much enjoyed my time here. I've already tasted port across the river. Um, obrigado. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, we, we will now have time for one or two questions if uh, you want to. And then we'll have the first coffee break. Yeah, this one over here. presentation and uh, addressing this, uh, this problem. Um, I remembered um, a, a, a talk, a conference that uh, um, Richard Feynman made many years ago uh, where he, uh, he was addressing uh, teachers and he was trying to think, synthesize what he thought about what was science. And uh, in the end he said, I think we could define science as the ignorance of the, um, of the experts. Um, and uh, could we use that in the sense that, um, okay, uh, you, you can be a denial uh, and you can do something about it. Uh, uh, so we um, opening the, the, the understanding that, uh, okay, if, if, uh, if you disbelieve something, uh, um, there, there are ways. Science, it, it's really uh, the opportunity for you. Uh, if you don't agree with it, you could go on and do something about it. So, one of, the, one of the interesting things about deniers is that they often use the, the language of science to talk about their, 
why they're denying it. So a climate ch change denier just says, I'm just being skeptical about the data. Isn't that what I'm supposed to do as a scientist? I'm just saying there are multiple models out there, and don't we have to test multiple models? That's the evolution people will say that. Well, there's, I mean, we have evolution, and then there's, there's other models of how we can come to be, intelligent design. We can, we can, we should be test, we should be teaching. It's called teach the controversy. It's the label that's used in the United States. So what that means is that on the one hand, yes, we can use the claim that let's all be ignorant and let's try to use, let's try to come up with experiments and so forth. The problem is that the deniers have already, in a sense, taken on that language and use it to continue denying. And so I, well, part of me, the part of me that's an idealist, the part of me that says that's what's so great about science is we ask questions and we try to see what the answers are, and is frustrated by the fact that that doesn't, that that, that way of thinking has been co-opted and twisted by deniers, and I don't know, I, so while on the one hand I want, to, I want to agree with you, but I'm a little concerned that, we, that that's already been tried. Maybe, but there's got to be new ways. Uh, uh, regarding this, I think maybe uh, one thing that should be taken into consideration is that in a lot of instances, when we talk about public engagement and when we talk about science in decision making, we tend, and deniers also do the same thing, tend to reduce the decision on science. And making decisions is not only about science. So I, what I'm wondering is, couldn't we follow the advice, for instance, from AAAS, that we just say simply, that is not science? And so if you want to make decisions, Yes, it's okay to come up with other arguments like ethical, social, and economic, but don't tell me that the science, scientific argument is taking pl place. And I'm just recalling the last discussion about Bill Nye's discussion with uh, you know, creationists yes. and everything and how it spread again this discussion. The, it, would, it would be nice if we could draw a simple line between science and non-science, but it turns out that we can't because it turns out that the very questions we ask as scientists are shaped by politics and by, by economics. So the decision, why are we investing, why is so much money going into nanotechnology instead of into um, uh, solving food problems? Because there's lots of money to be made in nanotechnology, right? So it's, and it's seen as an economic driver. And so governments have made decisions. And so we can't actually separate the decision to work on something to ask questions, and sometimes even the way we ask questions, from various kinds of economic or social or, or political questions. So it, it turns out that when you get down to the nitty gritty, it actually turns out to be very hard to draw those lines. If you, if you want to say climate change and the IPCC, the IPCC is a tool of a world domination organization. Well, some people would describe the UN in that way. Right? Um, and have deep suspicions of it in a world where nationalism and local, local power are, imp are important. Why should we let some impersonal international organization, no matter who they've organized and how they've organized it, um, to, to tell us what to believe? And, it, and, and there's a certain sense in which, well, yeah, there, are, there is some set of scientists who are asking questions about parts of the consensus not the core, but it's really hard to say where that is between the cores. So again, the idealist in me would like to be able to do that, but the person who's been studying history and sociology of science for 30 years says, no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. There's a microphone to go in the back. Thank you, Bruce. Very inspiring uh, talk. Uh, I was just wondering, another important issue is also um, whether the public want to be involved in these um, policy making decisions about science and technology. Um, there's um, a recent study in the UK that has just shown that um, only 2% of the public really want, is involved in science policy making, and only 8% uh, 
uh, want to be involved in policy making. Mm -hmm. So we talk about you know public engagement. It's really the really the the good thing to do, and is seen as the good thing thing to do by institution institutions all over the world. Um, but are we actually doing the right thing? Are we involving and engaging the public the way they want to be engaged? Um, so I think this is, I mean, I think it is really important. So there's, there's two aspects of that. One is not everybody wants to be engaged, right? For a lot of people, they get up in the morning, they got to get the kids ready to go off to school, they send them off to school, they've got to go to a job that, all right, it's a job, let's hope they have a job. Um, they, you know, they, it's a job, it's not an exciting, stimulating one like the jobs most of us have. Um, they get home, they've got to get the kids, they've got to get dinner, they've got to make sure the kids have done their homework. Maybe they have time to fall asleep in front of the television for an hour before they finally go to bed and get up the next morning and do it all over again, right? Being involved in science policy is not part of what is on their list of high priorities. So one of the challenges for us is to think, you know, do people have to know about science? I don't know, do they have to know about history? Do they have to know about art? Um, do they have to know about geography? Um, there's lots of things that people don't know and don't get involved in, and what is it that's particular about science? Because those other things are pretty important for society too. The second issue is that, okay, even if we think that there are, that there is a set of people we want to be engaging with, how can we, how can we better engage with them. And here's where thinking about the lay knowledge, the citizen science, the maker communities, those are ways of, sort of newer ways of thinking about reaching to communities who do not think about what they're doing as science. They think about it as some other set of activities, thinking about hobbies. A um, lot of people, you know, the number of people who are gardeners or bird watchers um, or uh, collect seashells all of which involve many scientific ideas and all of which can be wonderful ways of getting people engaged in that educational engagement way and maybe tools for then getting them engaged in that political way are ways that we need to be thinking about doing. So there are, I think, one, I think there are lots of possibilities for being creative about how we get people um, involved. I think we have to be realistic about our goals that we're never going to get everybody involved. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. We will be back at 11.15, okay? Coffee break now. Thank you, Bruce, again. Thank you. Thank you.